Life has purpose now and never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For the joy and peace I can't explain is mine. Since I found your life in Christ my Lord divine. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. I can go to God direct. I can go directly to the Lord in prayer. He has told me I may boldly answer there. And he listens as his promises are clear. I find mercy there for grace in every need. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. And the hope of glory heaven thrills me so. Where I'll live with Christ forevermore, I know. That is why the things of earth I loosely hold. I have eternal riches better far than gold. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. It is wonderful to be a Christian. And I hope you can sing that song tonight as a Christian. All right. Thank you for joining us for our evening service tonight on this beautiful May evening. Let us take our hymn books. Turn to 245, the old account was settled long ago, and I trust and hope that you settled the account with God, not because of what you've done, but settled it with the Lord Jesus Christ by believing on his name. And so let us sing all four verses of the old account was settled long ago. was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went unto the keeper and settled it long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago, the old account was large and growing every day, for I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe, I said that I would settle. I settled it long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. Today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. When in the happy home, my Savior's home above, I'll sing redemption's story and praise him for his love. I'll not forget that book with pages white as snow because he came and settled and settled it long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. No sinner, trust the Lord, be cleansed of all your sin, for thus he hath provided for you to enter in, and then if you should live a hundred years below, up there you'll not regret it 
You settled it long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago. Long ago, settled by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us begin our time with a word of prayer. Ask the Lord to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for a beautiful day for us to be able to gather. And yeah, although not in our building yet, but we are able to gather together virtually. And we're grateful for that, Lord. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll continue to work in hearts, continue to draw us closer to you, continue to challenge us, both through the singing of these songs, the preaching of your word, and the time that we spend just with us and the Lord. And so, Father, I pray that you'll just continue to work in hearts, and uh, also that you'll continue to use us in this particular time we find ourselves in. Father, now we pray for our service. We pray that everything we do here will glorify and honor you. And Lord, we also pray that the message will touch hearts tonight. And so, Father, just do a work in all of us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. All right. Let us take our hymn books again. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Number 250. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at service still coming to you online this week Wednesday night at 6 p.m. so or 7 p.m. sorry join us for that and uh, we appreciate your faithfulness and your support through uh, this time in coming out and checking out our services online and of course we appreciate your prayers as well be praying for the return to our church building and so we are excited about the news on Friday 
that this coming Sunday we're able to return to our church. We have a few things to uh, prepare for that. We have to put up some signage on uh, proper uh, physical distancing and, of course, uh, proper hand washing and whatnot. And so some things we need to put in place to get ready for that. So pray for us as we do that. And, but also pray for one another as we're able to come back and see each other face to face. Of course, we won't be able to uh, hug and shake hands and all that, considering the, uh, we're still in a restricted phase. We're not back to normal yet. But uh, it's going to be uh, wonderful at least to see everyone eye to eye. And so we'll have to uh, uh, air, air high five and uh, air hugs and all that good stuff uh, and get creative. Anyway, be uh, praying to that end that everything uh, will be able to uh, have regular services. Keep in mind, we're not going to be starting Sunday school yet. And so regular service, 11 o'clock Sunday at the church. And then an evening service at 6 p.m. And we are planning to have... A midweek service and so uh, uh, it probably won't be our traditional prayer meeting but we'll modify that some but we'll still of course be singing some songs and looking at the Word of God so plan to uh, join us for that as well keep praying for one another and uh, of course uh, I know uh, folks have been calling each other and that's wonderful keep it up be an encouragement to uh, someone who's not able to get out. That's everything I have for announcements. Let us turn to number 240. That's 240, the Lily of the Valley. He says, I have found a place in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The Lily of the Valley in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. You know, Jesus can make you fully whole by believing on him. And so let us sing all three verses of this uh, song. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty town. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Okay, well, let us take our Bibles at this time. Oh, a little sip. Forgot.
forgot to uh, put my water back on the mantle, so I'm grateful for even being handy to share hers with me. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I hope and trust that our study through the book of 1 John has been a blessing to you. And so we are going to continue that, and at this time, we're looking at verses 12 to 14. It's interesting, as we read through this letter of 1 John, that we see these uh, uh, repeated phrases that uh, tend to stand out. And it does, so. Uh, when you see that pattern of repeated phrases, it does cause you to draw your attention to what uh, the author is saying here. I find it always kind of catches my attention, and so I want to see what uh, the author is trying to get across here. And we see this in the next uh, few verses that we're looking at tonight when he says repeatedly, I write unto you. And so he uh, wants to draw their attention to the reason why he's writing unto these individuals, writing unto uh, the recipient of this letter. And of course, that being is John is trying to write unto you and me as well, and trying to get a message across, trying to exhort, trying to encourage, trying to motivate us to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as born-again believers, that is what we ought to strive to do daily in our lives is to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and to glorify and honor God. In fact, that is our, our greatest purpose, is that we would glorify and honor God. So let's have a look here as we look at the passage. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him, that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. As we look at this particular passage, we see John breaks up the focus of this passage uh, into uh, addressing basically three different groups of Christians, three, certainly three different groups of readers here, but I think uh, John is kind of breaking it down into uh, three, three groups of uh, believers, and it, it, and what he does here sort of makes sense, because when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we're not all endowed with all knowledge from the Scriptures. How wonderful that would be if somehow God could infuse into us everything we need to know about Christianity the moment we get saved. It would make life, I think, a whole lot easier. It would probably keep us out of a lot of trouble if that were the case. But needless to say, that's not how it works. We begin with baby steps, by faith in Jesus Christ. And then, over time, we grow from there. And, of course, we all grow at different rates. Not everybody will uh, mature in their spiritual walk the same rate. God will use different instances and situations. Uh, even our, our own learning and ability to absorb and to understand things will have a factor into how quickly we mature in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know ourselves. Sometimes there's things we read and that we study, and we seem to understand them right away. And sometimes we have to come back to it again and again, and all of a sudden it'll be like, that finally makes sense. I've had that happen many different times in my life, where uh, the first few times through a particular uh, topic or passage, and I've had a basic understanding, but then sometime down the road, maybe because of experience or something else, and you finally realize, oh, now I understand that so much better. And that is what it's like in the walk of the born-again believer. As we 
read the Word of God over and over again, and as we mature by the experiences that we go through, watching God do a work in our lives, watching God shape and mold us and direct our lives, we have a greater understanding of those passages that we may have only had a superficial understanding in the past. And that's, that's the way it works. And, and John addresses really three different groups of believers here. They may be, of course, specific individuals of a certain age group, as you see by the description used, but uh, most likely uh, they're not necessarily of, the, of a specific age group, but more of a maturity in their understanding of the scriptures. He, begin, uh, he begins with the, the first group when he says there in verse 12, I write unto you, little children. It is believed that as John writes that, He's writing to those that are brand new in the faith. They've just come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've seen themselves as sinners before God in need of a Savior. And so, like little children, we have a basic knowledge of the Word of God. We have a basic knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is enough to save us. But he addresses them as, as he says there, I write unto you, little children. You notice in verse 12, he goes on to say, because, he gives a reason why he's writing, he says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. It makes sense in the passage there as he writes that, that he's encouraging and challenging these new believers, these little children, by reminding them that their sins have been forgiven them. You know, when you first accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm sure there was probably times when you wondered, have I done enough for my sins? But we're reminded that, you know what, we can't pay for our sins. In fact, as we look at this, look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, we go right back to the basics here. He says, your sins are forgiven you. We're reminded in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. Paul writes in uh, verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Kind of an interesting contrast that uh, Paul draws here as he groups Jews and Gentiles together. You see, Jews were seen as God's people, as they were. Gentiles, basically every other nation besides Jews, which traditionally were outside of God. But he says they're all one, not because they've been transformed into one nation, but they're all one and equal, he says, Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. We're all impacted by sin, every single one of us. Doesn't matter who we are, doesn't matter what age we are, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all impacted by sin. Let's read on. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues. They have used to seek the poison of asses under their lips. Not a very great description here. Look down in verse 21. He says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The, the law and the prophets are able to show us that, you know, according to these laws and instructions that the prophets were given directly by God, definitely is a way for us to measure, okay, are we walking according to God's word? Are we living in righteousness, or is there a problem here? And, of course, the scriptures, the commands of God, the prophets, very clearly are able to show all of us that when we stand before God, our lives are as filthy rags. No matter how good we are or attempt to be, we're still 
affected by sin. We're all sinners. Look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why John is reminding these children here. They've, they've come to understand this. But he says, young children, the, the new in the faith, he says, you're all sinners before God, but your sins are forgiven you. Not because we've done anything to achieve it, but because, as he says there in the passage, keep your thumb in Romans and turn back. Remember what we read there in verse number 12? I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Always the focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you go back to Romans chapter 3 and verse 28, he says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. In other words, by our attempts to obey the law perfectly, that's not going to deal with the sin problem that Paul talks about here. Let us turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. You notice in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 8, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, in verse 9, lest any man should boast. You see, that's a natural inclination of mankind, is to say, look what I have done. You know, if God had made salvation achievable by doing good works, that's how we would measure it. In fact, we would compare ourselves to others. We could say that because I have done more works to please God, I am more saved than the next guy because I've seen that he hasn't done as much. We would take the credit for our salvation. Boy, look how I've followed the law. Jesus confronted the rich young ruler. We won't turn there in the scriptures. And he says to him, he says, you know, have you kept all the law? And the, and the ruler says, yeah. He says, I've, I've kept the law from my birth. What else must I do to be saved? And Jesus makes it clear that you know what? You, you can't do it by keeping the works of the law. Jesus says to the young ruler, he says, give it all up and follow me. And it says he went away sorrowful because he was rich and he was not willing to give it all up for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, covetousness had settled into his heart. He had sinned against God because he wasn't willing to give up that which he had set his heart upon to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. All sin and come short of the glory of God, but it says here that not of works, lest any man should boast. Let's carry on, Ephesians 2, verse 10. <coughs> uh, sorry, go back, uh, he says in verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we recognize as John is writing unto these brand new believers, your sins are forgiven you because Jesus Christ has paid for them on the cross of Calvary. And you have believed by faith in Jesus Christ. Look at, uh, turn to Hebrews, if you will, for a moment. Hebrews chapter 10 Here I am bouncing between Hebrews, the first of Hebrews and the end of Hebrews. And if you notice in verse 4, it says in verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 10, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should Take away sins. Again, that reference to the fact that works cannot take away, cannot forgive us for our sins, but only the Lord Jesus Christ. Look down, if you will, to chapter 11, 
and verse number one, it says, Now faith is the substance of what? Of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And then he goes on to list all these individuals here who time and time again with each one of those verses says by faith they did the things that God speaks of here because of their faith in God, in the promise of the Savior to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says your sins are forgiven you. Go back to John, 1 John Chapter 2, I write unto you, little children, he says, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. He writes to encourage them that, yes, they are forgiven because they had put their faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus took their sins away. They were saved by faith. You notice he repeats it again in the end of verse 13. He repeats that same phrase, I write unto you, little children. And this time he says, because ye have known the Father. You see, they, 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 he's able to write unto them, little children, that they were new in the faith because they had known God. They were they, they, he's right, acknowledging the fact that they're children of God, their Heavenly Father. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, in verse 14, For as many, he says, as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the what? They are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. They've learned from the very beginning that God is their Heavenly Father, their Abba, Father. Verse 16, And the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together by their faith in Jesus Christ. Their sins have been forgiven them, and they have become the children of God. That's what he means here when he says they knew the Father. God is now their Heavenly Father because of their faith in Jesus Christ. He writes to the first group there, little children. I write unto you, little ch children, to encourage you in your new faith. Then let's look at the next one. <clears throat> next one we see in verse 13 there. He says, I write unto you fathers, because you've known him. We we're going to come back to that one. That is from the beginning. But he says, I write unto you young men. He says it again down in verse 14. Towards the end there, I've written unto you young men. Basically, now he's drawing attention to, or writing unto them that are established in the faith. So, so these aren't the brand new believers, but these are the young men, the, uh, the young men that have all put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they've experienced a little bit of life and have has seen God do a work in their lives. Look what he says here. In verse 13, he says, I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. And then in verse 14 again, I've written unto you, young men, because you're strong, he says, and the word of God abideth you in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. And so we, we, that's how we know he's describing here um, those that are more established in the faith. They've had uh, what he's saying there in those three things that he references in both verse 13 and verse 14, when he says uh, that, first of all, I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. In other words, they've withstood temptation. These individuals came to the faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ and have now had that faith tested. They've now had that, that uh, faith tempted. And they've seen for themselves how their relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ has protected them. He says that they were strong. They withstood temptation. They didn't allow the temptation of the world to turn them away from God and away from the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells them that they were strong. It takes strength to stand against the wiles of the devil. We talked about that a bit in our morning message. We talked about the fact that we're to put on the whole armor of God. We're to prepare ourselves for spiritual battle. And yes, life as a born-again believer, is a, you enter into a spiritual battle. Because, as I said this morning, Satan wants to destroy your testimony. There's nothing that he hates more than seeing an individual come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these, this group of individuals that he's writing here, these young men, are established in the faith. They've, they've had their faith tested and they've withstood temptation, as he says there, I read unto you, because ye were strong. And then the second part, he says, and the word of God abideth in you. In other words, they had demonstrated a testimony of their relationship in Jesus Christ. So not only were they strong in their faith, but the word of God, he says, abideth in them. And in other words, John is saying, I'm able to observe the word of God working in your life. What a great testimony when individuals can say, that that person is different. That person handled this situation different than most people would. That's the Word of God working in your life as a born-again believer. When we go through a situation, we go through a circumstance, and we respond differently than what the natural fleshly reaction would be to that situation. Not always easy for us to do. Let's face it, we still struggle with the flesh. But when we do that, that has such a tremendous testimony upon the unsaved world. Individuals look upon us and say, you know what, that person's different. I didn't expect them to respond that way. That's the, the word of God abiding in our life. Just being faithful to God, faithful to uh, uh, coming to church, faithful to reading your Bible, faithful to praying, all those things is the word of God abiding in our life. Especially when we're doing it because it's a part of our life, not doing it simply out of obligation to God. It's wonderful. You know, as, as the, you know, you talk about the little children, that's the one thing that the newborn again believer has to learn to do. Make the word of God, make the worship of God a daily part of his life so that it's something we desire to do, we want to do. We're not just doing it because pastor tells us we have to do it. The young men here, they were strong because they withstood temptation. They were, the word of God abided in their lives. It was demonstrated in their testimony, in the way that they lived for God. How, how spiritual things were just a natural part of their life. And then the final one that he mentions here is he says, uh, back in verse 14, he says, And ye have overcome the wicked one. In other words, they experienced victory in their life it's wonderful to experience victory even in the small things where we, we all have those things that will happen in our life that will push us or will test our relationship with god and our testimony with the lord jesus christ and i won't go into mentioning any but i know especially when we were new believers just a few things that had come up almost right away decisions that we had to make and it was amazing how God gave us the ability and the strength to make the right decisions. And then we saw God bless us in such a mighty way. It was so evident early on in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? It's still evident today. There's still times, even over the last eight weeks, we've seen God just work in our lives and give us the, the victory over small things. And how wonderful it is to experience uh, God's victory in our lives. And these young men, that's, that's what's described in this group of individuals here. 
is they were established in their faith. They had the chance to experience some life. They, they, they withstood temptation. They demonstrated a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. And they experienced victory. And what a wonderful thing it is to fall into that group of individuals. And then the third group that he speaks to here to encourage and to exhort is the last ones that he mentions when he says, I write unto you in verse 13, Fathers, because ye have known him that was from the beginning. And he repeats the same thing again, verse 14, I have written unto you, Fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. What more would John have to say? This group of people are those that were the mature faithful. In fact, probably calling attention to those that, uh, like John, probably for many of them, these are the ones that had been saved for some time, most likely those that had even seen the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves. Look at 1 John chapter 1. We read this back in the beginning when we started our study here. And he says, verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, so John is giving testimony of the fact that he was one of those individuals that had been there during the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, that which we had heard. He had heard the messages that Jesus taught and proclaimed. He says, which we have seen with our eyes. They saw him face to face. They saw the work that he did. They saw the miracles that Jesus performed. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to be one of those individuals to have seen the very work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we can be because we can see it in the written word that we have today. You know, it, the, these accounts are still true and we can read them for ourselves. And it's the, the mature believer that reads through this and says, you know what? Amen. That is that is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wrote it down, and I believe it. <clears throat> he says, We have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Wouldn't it have been amazing to be able to <clears throat> shake the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that he was God's Son, knowing that he was the Messiah, the promised one. And then, of course, knowing all the work that Jesus did and then what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary. As John writes to these fathers back in 1 John chapter 2, he says, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. They <clears throat> had the opportunity to really get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the testimony of the mature believer. Oh, we may not have the chance to have had, and of course, in this day and age, 2,000 years later, we, we have not had the chance to see the Lord Jesus Christ in person. But you know what? That mature believer, he is the one that has seen the work of the Lord Jesus Christ worked out in his life day by day. And how wonderful it is to be able to Look back in your life and say, wow, look how God worked here. Look how God worked there. Look how God brought this together. Look how Jesus impacted my life in so many different ways. John, writing to each one of these individuals, I write unto you little children, I write unto you young men, and I write unto you fathers, keep doing what you're doing. Keep learning more about the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep learning about your Heavenly Father. Keep living it out in your lives and maturing day by day. You know, even the, even the fathers he's referring to here, guess what? They're not done maturing in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, we're not done until God has taken us up into glory. It is, we, are, we are constantly a work in progress. We may find ourselves somewhere along the path, and we fit into one of these three groups of individuals. But we are there, <clears throat> and if we are faithful to God, 
faithful to his word, faithful to his worship, we will progress from one of these groups to another. But it will be a cost of work right up until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and takes us up into glory. But you know what? It's a wonderful process because we're learning more and more about him each and every day. And I'm glad that it's not a finished work. I'm glad we'll never get to that point where we'll say, okay, I've done enough. I know, I know everything I need to know about God. I know everything I need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. How sad it would be to get to that point and say, okay, I've done it all. And of course, that would be the problem, wouldn't it? Is we would take the glory for it. Now, Jesus is continuing to do a work in our lives. And as John writes unto these Groups, as John writes this letter unto you, born-again believer, keep growing in the Lord. That's what he's trying to tell them here. Keep doing what you're doing. Praise the Lord for what God has done so far. Keep being faithful, keeping your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and allowing him to mature you into Christ-likeness. Where do you fit into one of these groups? Are you the brand-new believer, just learning about Jesus Christ, trying to figure out <clears throat> how to live and how to glorify and honor God in your life? Well, praise the Lord. Continue studying God's Word. Maybe you're that young man, young woman, that, that person that's right in the middle there, has, has seen God do a work in their life. Don't give up. Don't quit now. Keep staying faithful to the Lord. Maybe you're that mature believer. And maybe you're saying, well, I've, I've done it all. What more can I do for God? Well, guess what? Your work is never done. Yeah, you may get to the point where physically you can't do any more even, but you can still continue to pray. And you know, even in our prayer life, we become more Christ-like. So keep doing it. Keep being faithful. Keep serving God. Father, we thank you for our time tonight. Once again, a wonderful passage out of the book of 1 John, the letter of 1 John. We thank you for that. We thank you for the exhortation that we find in this passage, the encouragement to each and every one of us, no matter where we are in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, to continue to be faithful, to continue to serve, to continue to grow, to become even more Christ-like. So, Father, I do pray you'll work in our hearts, draw us close to you, and Lord, help us to achieve your will and purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and ask, Amen. Let us take our hymn books one more time. And we are going to close. We are going to close with 259. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. You know, that's a wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful thing about uh, the Word of God and the changes that the Word of God makes in our lives is it begins with salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and understanding that Jesus saves, not us by our works, but Jesus Christ does. And so let's sing verse 1, 2, and 3. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis the Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing the islands of the sea, echo back the ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing it softly through the gloom, when the heart for mercy craves, sing it triumph o'er the tomb, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and keep
teach us and we are to grow to become more Christ-like, more like Him. Well, we look forward to seeing you midweek online here. And then, of course, we look forward to seeing you on Sunday if you're able to make it out 11 o'clock Sunday morning at our church. May the Lord bless you in the week ahead.